Hi, everyone, and welcome to Social Emotional Learning Strategies During Remote Instruction. My name is Laura Clark, and I'm excited to be sharing with you in our New Teacher Academy. So you've got access to the training guide that you see here on the left. And just to quickly walk you through the steps, um, hopefully you've downloaded either the three slide page view or one slide page view to take some notes. Um, there are a few hyperlinks throughout this presentation and you can access those all by just clicking on the links um, in the PDF files. There should be two videos. You're watching the first one and then there'll be a second one for the last half of the presentation. After you do those, I'd ask that you take just a few minutes to reflect on all of the things that you've seen in the two videos and on the slides. What is something that you're gonna implement right away? And what are some possible action steps you would take later in the year? And you might wanna highlight those on your slides. Then the very last step is to go ahead and take the end of training quiz that's linked there at step four. You'll need 80% to earn your PD certificate. And after you earn that 80%, it will automatically come to your email. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to help. And if you'd like to dive deeper, there are many other trainings on social emotional learning, behavior strategies, and trauma informed care at our NKCES um, professional learning online website. All of the trainings there are free, and I'd encourage you to dive in at your leisure. And I've hyperlinked um, that resource in at the last step. So without further ado, let's dive in together. One thing that I would encourage you to consider is what we like to call the power of pause. And when we're thinking about supporting our students and our students' families and our own selves as we um, begin this teaching adventure, it's really important every day and every week to just take some time to pause and reflect on your instruction, on where you are in your own social emotional development, and really think through are there things that you can do to support your own um, social emotional health and that of your students and their families. I've linked you into a fantastic growth mindset video in the bottom corner and that really has some great concepts. If you get a chance to dive in and watch that, I'd highly encourage you to do that. Um, because as we are growing in our profession, and you know, for those of us that have been teaching for decades and more, I still pause quite often to just really reflect on what I'm doing. You know, is it current practice? Is it research-based or evidence-based practice? Is it what's best for our students and our families, uh, the teachers we work with for our district and our region and our state? Um, and really try and make effective changes based on that reflection. So the power of pause is super important. So whether you have a chance to go sit out on a lake um, or just take a moment in your car, um, power of pause is a good thing for us. We want to make sure when we're thinking about social emotional learning, especially when we're thinking about remote learning, that all students, no matter if they are face to face to us in the school or if we're only seeing them on a screen or maybe only communicating with them by email or by phone, that they feel that they are seen that they are heard and that they have a voice or that they can share with us. So I encourage you to keep this image in your mind that we really wanna make sure that no student ever feels like this, but rather that they know we value them, they are seen, they are heard, and they can always share with us. For many of us um, here in where we are currently in our learning, in our teaching, um, our brains are stressed and finding and saving information can be as challenging as it would be to navigate through um, this bookstore or library. So we want to do all we can to support our students' social emotional health and help them recall and find key information. Um, as we're processing through COVID-19 and remote learning, and for some of our students who are coming back and forth between face-to-face -face and then NTI, or students that are completely remote learning, and their processing speed can definitely be affected. Our own processing speed can be effective. So we want to always kind of keep this image in mind of 
asking students to retrieve singular pieces of information can be as intimidating and frustrating as finding a book, a single book in this um, jumbled up mess right here. Great image to keep in our heads. This is ideally what we want our students' brains to be like, right? If we think about this beautiful closet and each of the items in this closet as a piece of content knowledge that we have lovingly, skillfully taught our students and we're asking them to retrieve those, right? Go and find your black shoes. Go and find your short sleeve, light blue shirt. Um, go and find the um, 19th president of the United States, um, the three stages of the water cycle, right? We're trying to help them organize their content knowledge and retrieve it. And the same is true with your social emotional learning skills. In order for our students to be able to access that knowledge, retrieve it and apply it, they have to be able to maneuver through their brains. So if you think about your brain as being a closet, we can either have a closet full of knowledge like this, or we can have every single item thrown on the floor in the bottom of this closet, and our students will struggle to retrieve it. So the ultimate goal for our teaching, whether it's academic content or social emotional skills, um, always think about what hanger you are placing that knowledge on. And those hangers are the neural pathways the students have to race through to retrieve information. We can build hangers for our students um, by tacking knowledge onto a uh, new knowledge onto knowledge that they already have, helping them develop and organize their schema or their knowledge base. So this closet image really helps me think through. I want my students to retrieve this knowledge to be able to find it quickly and easily to be able to access and use it. How can I help them organize it? When we think about social emotional learning, we're kind of looking at these five big rocks. So we're looking at understanding and managing our emotions, setting and achieving goals, making responsible decisions, feeling and showing empathy for others, and establishing and maintaining positive relationships. And as teachers, no matter if we're teaching students at a preschool level or in AP chemistry, we're still looking at these five main areas to support our students. This can look very different in a remote learning setting. So for our students to understand and manage their emotions, you know, we're not sitting side by side with them to um, help them process through that. So what tools can we share with them that they can use independently? When we look at setting and achieving goals, we're keeping in mind that our students have lots of stress going on right now. And so setting and achieving long-term goals might be overwhelming. We might need to break those down into smaller pieces and we might need to find a system that our students will be able to access when we're not there, um, again, side by side, helping them break tasks down. So maybe sending them calendar invites, for example, might help them with setting and achieving goals. Making responsible decisions for many of our students can be challenging, especially if they are not meeting with us every day or several times a day. Um, to talk through the tasks that they are being asked to accomplish and to prioritize their work. Feeling and showing empathy for others when you're not face to face with someone can be very challenging for us as adults and definitely for students. So helping uh, students learn to read body language um, through a camera feed rather than face to face that might be a skill that we would be working on. And establishing and maintaining positive relationships from a distance. Again, skills that we might need to break down into smaller pieces for our students. Because right now we're giving virtual hugs and high fives um, and we need to help our students process that. One of my all time favorite resources when we talk about social emotional learning is Castle. And Castle's website is resource rich with information that we can use um, to help us in our classroom practice, but also to support parents. On the left hand side, you'll see they have what they call the wheel and competencies of social emotional learning. And they've broken that down from classroom to school to home and community. And when you look over here on the right hand side, um, one of the key things that we need to make sure that we are doing is explicitly teaching social emotional learning. The concept of explicit instruction um, was 
created for us by Anita Archer. We have several um, online trainings on our online learning website focusing on explicit instruction, one focused on explicit instruction of behaviors. So I'd encourage you to check that out if you haven't um, considered how to explicitly teach those concepts of social emotional learning. We also want to make sure that we're integrating that within our academic instruction. That's just part of how we're teaching and that we're offering students the opportunity to have a voice and to engage in the learning. And just like that original image, our students need to be seen, they need to be heard, and they need to be able to have a voice. Again, a little deeper dive into CASEL's website. Um, if you want to open up the wheel and look a little bit deeper at what it means to teach um, self-awareness, what it means to teach social awareness, responsible decision making. Here are those skills broken down into their subsets. And there is information on teaching each of those subset skills on CASEL's website. In addition, CASEL's done a fantastic job throughout COVID-19 and um, all of the issues that have been happening across the United States related to um, equity they have um, really taken a deep dive and provided us a lot of new resources. So if you want to look at social emotional learning around COVID-19 and as a lever for equity, um, please check out these hyperlinks on this slide. In addition, there's a bunch of tools that really help us analyze our teaching practice and what we're doing with social emotional learning. And there have, were some concerns that were raised nationwide mm -hmm. about social emotional learning and how it is not always being managed equitably for students of color, but that instead um, teachers are sometimes using that uh, more as a hammer or more trying to make all students you know, fit into that square peg when our students come in all shapes and sizes and have all different um, strengths and needs. So we don't want to look at social emotional learning for any student or for students of color as a deficit mindset, but rather we want to focus on skills that our students have and what those skills look like within that student's community. So the National Equity Project um, is a great resource to dive a little bit deeper into and really start thinking through with your new teaching practice and also for your team and your school, how you're managing social emotional learning and is your social emotional learning curriculum and your approach um, one that is equitable for all students. So let's talk about the big picture, that structure and organization. How can we support social emotional learning across our instruction? Well, one of the first resources I would encourage you to dive into, and this is a larger resource, but it is just rich with um, tips and tools for all teachers when it comes to looking at remote instruction and um, all instruction, not just social emotional learning, but also behavioral and academic skills. Um, a phenomenal circle. So your school should have in place what they're either calling um, RTI, which stands for Response to Intervention, or MTSS, that Multi-Tiered Systems of Support, where we're really looking at and screening all students. You know, how are all of my students doing? Whether we're in a face-to-face -face or a remote learning situation, how are they doing across all domains? And when we conduct that initial screening, if we have some students that um, have some needs, then we're gonna look at what kind of supports that we're going to provide. And we're gonna provide those in an evidence-based way. We're gonna teach skills and monitor how our students are going, making sure that we're connecting with resources. And this is absolutely a positive, predictable, and safe learning environment that is our ultimate goal for each and every one of our students. When you dive into this resource, you will see just so many fantastic ideas, and there are a ton of hyperlinks. These are screenshots, so unfortunately, if you click on these items, they're not going to take you anywhere. Um, you'll need to actually go to this first slide and download the resource here. Once you download the resource, then everything that you see here in a screenshot will be clickable. But I did want to point out again that when we look at teaching skills for our students, we're looking at that explicit and systematic instruction. We have multiple trainings on our website um, that focus on how to teach the skills that are recommended for supporting students 
So again, deeper dives, whether we're looking at trauma-informed care or explicit instruction, whether we're trying to analyze the function of the behavior that's happening or build executive function skills in our students. Um, some excellent ideas for how to do that. When we are looking at our um, classroom expectations for students when we are doing remote learning, we want to make sure that what we're setting forth makes logical sense. And so I love this visual. Many of our schools have guidelines, something along the lines of respect for self and others, responsibility and safety. I mean, you might say them different ways, but these are usually the foundational cornerstones of our goals for our students. And many of us hopefully are teaching in schools where those expectations are clearly stated in areas like the hallway, our classrooms, on the bus. But we need to expand those to what does it look like in an online group and what does it look like when you're working remotely independent. So I thought this was a fantastic way to kind of take what's already in place in your school and then what does it look like for online learning and what does it look like for us across all settings. So a great um, suggestion for modifying what you've got in place. There's also some additional guidance about connecting with families and things that we can do. So during in-person learning, we're often greeting our students at the door to start that connection immediately. Um, but we have to modify that for online learning. So we're making sure that we're giving students positive greetings as they're logging in, we're welcoming them, we're checking in with students individually and providing supports. In addition, a lot of our families are asking for help to provide that appropriate structure. So here are some great suggestions, whether you teach in elementary and preschool or a secondary, what might you share with parents? Love those ideas. There are also some additional supports within here for what it might look like to break down your classroom expectations from school to home to make those work out appropriately. There are so many fantastic resources that I wanted to share several of them with you so that you could bookmark them to use later. And let's start with the Kentucky Department of Education. KDE has built tons of great resources for remote learning, really focusing on we're making sure all students are heard, are seen, and can have a voice. One of my favorite resources um, was this presentation that's been shared with us on KDE's website that focuses on behavioral health for staff and students during COVID-19. And they've shared with us a lot of the sources of stress for our students. And so I took those stressors and kind of broke them down into what should we be doing to support our students with their social emotional learning. So we know that lots of students have anxiety about developing COVID-19 or getting sick in general. And so we definitely want to provide opportunities where students can share those concerns with us. Lots of students are feeling disconnected. There's not a support system in place and they don't have access to um, supports that they need. So we definitely want to try and build community through engagement activities, which means that some of our time online should be devoted to helping students um, dive in, learn more about each other, and, and just get involved. We also know that COVID-19 stress definitely is affecting our students, that they're not getting as much, co much cognitive stimulation as they might, and they definitely are feeling some monotony in the routine. So we want to provide supports um, for those cognitive demands. Many of our students are really struggling right now with um, what we're asking them to do in school because they haven't had to do it in a while. So breaking tasks down into lists, providing video supports, not just for content, but if we're asking them to complete an assignment, providing a short video that walks them through how to do the assignment can make a significant difference for students. Giving them some exemplars and again using some video supports to develop that exemplar and then providing some um, group tasks where students are able to work together can really help with that. We know that many of our students don't always have access to the normal coping strategies that they might have. And they also might be living in households that are stressed or that have limited resources. They might be under some financial stress um, due to limited work opportunities. So we want to make sure that we're connecting with the Family Resource Center and our guidance and counseling supports in our district and school 
when concerns arise and our students are sharing things with us. Lots of students are expressing feelings of loss and grief and uncertainty, so we definitely want to be teaching new coping strategies, supporting them with mindfulness and growth mindset. We also want to make sure that we're giving very clear structure to the learning and providing lots of visuals and schedules that students can use to stay on track. Because if you're worried about not having enough food and uh, not having rent money in your home, um, then definitely schoolwork might be a lower priority. And so anything that's stressful, they might not have help completing those tasks or might not have the mental capacity and energy to finish the task. So we want to make things as simple as we can. On KDE's website, you'll see they have resources broken down into elementary and middle high school resources. And it's a great idea to dive deeply into these resources um, to support your students. One fantastic resource that you'll probably want to check out um, is the COVID-19 considerations for reopening schools. There are a whole host of links here that have excellent resources, including the suggestion to incorporate brain and body breaks into daily lessons, making sure that we're creating a space for our students to feel safe. And that's not just a physical space, but an online space where students can share. For example, you might want to have just an open Google form and let students know that it's set up anonymously so that when they are concerned, they can send that to you. Um, it'll be a non-judgmental way for you to get information and um, it will be anonymous so that it won't come back um, to um, upset them later. There's also great information about crisis hotlines. When you're saying to yourself, okay, now, so what really are my top items of things I need to do to protect and support my students? Um, these are the top recommendations that we're promoting that psychological safety for our students. Um, we're acknowledging what's going on. You know, we are in the middle of COVID-19 and this is what's happening. And um, we want to rapidly identify students who are not being successful in the transition back to school, whether they're not getting work done, they're not logging in, and that we're following our school's guidance for how to manage that. Some excellent questions to consider that you might want to hang on to. In addition, we know that lots of our students are experiencing stress um, around all of the issues that have been happening um, across our social political landscape. So excellent guidance to help us in the classroom have conversations about race-based stress and trauma. Um, if you dive into this resource and the KDE link for both of these um, documents, um, they will give you fantastic information. In addition, we have two online trainings focusing on culturally responsive teaching and anti-racism on the website that can help you with resources. Our ultimate focus in supporting our students is a healing-centered approach. We're really diving in and asking students, what's strong with you? As opposed to the question we might have asked five or 10 years ago, what's wrong with you? Why are you acting that way? What are you doing? Right? We're going to focus on healing-centered approach. How can I help you? How can I support you in your learning? I understand things are stressful right now. How can I help you? And tell me what's strong with you. We're going to take a pause. Our first video, I'd like to encourage you and invite you to take some time to reflect on the resources that we've looked at, um, catch up any notes that you might have missed. And then when you're ready, go ahead and start the second video. Um, and we will round out our learning on social emotional supports during remote instruction.